Recently, I know the game has stirred up a bit of controversy, whether it's him talking about Eminem, Dr. Dre, or a bunch of other things. Now, I don't agree with some of the stuff that he said, especially what he said about Dr. Dre, but seeing how people were talking about him made me really want to rewind the clock back to 2005 when the game released an absolute classic. I've been wanting to do like a video about the game for like a minute, but right now I felt like it was the perfect time to release this but you know to like remind people why they might have liked or even heard of the game in the first place but before i get more into the video i would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys could be doing a million other things right now but instead you're here with me and i appreciate that if you guys like the content you guys should like comment and subscribe to help the channel grow also follow my instagram too that would be greatly appreciated you guys can always reach out and just show me some love it's all good also let me know where you are tuning in from represent where you're from especially if you're from that west soy give me your top five favorite tracks from the album mine are dreams running how we do hate it or love it and put you on the game let me know what it was like when this album first dropped because i always like to you know hear those comments but without further ado i give you the documentary the story behind the classic To start off the video, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of 2004. If you're new to this series of the story behind the classic, I start one year before the album dropped officially and go from there, so this is just a heads up. If you want to know more about the game's come up, then I highly suggest that you go watch the documentary DVD, which is available on YouTube for you to watch. But by 2004, the game had been signed with Dr. Dre in Aftermath for a little minute and people there knew the game was always an incredible MC and super dope, but there were some problems with him early on. The game was great at spitting bars, but when it came time for writing hooks and being a great songwriter, he just wasn't there yet. Later on in this video, in the last part where I break down the album song by song, you will notice that this will be a reoccurring thing throughout the making of the album. But by 2004, the game was with G-Unit, who was the hottest thing out around this time. 50 Cent had a monstrous year in 2003 with his debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying. The G-Unit Beg for Mercy album also dropped in 2003 and did very well also, but this was obviously before the game officially joined the group. You had 50 Cent. Lloyd Banks and Tony Yayo representing the East while Young Buck was representing the South and the game was now representing the West. The game was built to be the return of the West Coast in a way because the West Coast just wasn't the same after the 90s. Now how the game became involved in G-Unit is that the game was with Dr. Dre and Aftermath. Now Angelo Sanders who was an A&R at Aftermath at the time says that the game wanted to be his own artist from day one. He said says that despite this, the game fully embraced it, and if you've ever watched a documentary DVD, the game speaks very highly of G-Unit and 50 Cent. Angelo would say, he could have said no, but at the same time, what are you going to do if you're an artist in that position? You going to stand around and wait like the rest of Dre's artists, or are you going to come out since you got the hottest dude in the game at the time saying, I'm going to co-sign it and I got your back. 50 Cent had just sold 10 million records. How are you not going to ride with this dude? You have to, but it's not like how 50's relationships was with Lloyd Banks and Tony Yayo, where he had more of a personal long relationship with them. This was more of a business move that didn't play out so well. G-Unit could have been the Beatles, man. The game never asking to be in G-Unit is something that has been said by multiple people close to the situation. Even Jim Jones, who had a relationship with the game, with them doing Certified Gangsters in 2004, said this. He had already had this deal, but they wasn't sure what to do with him at Interscope, and that's why they signed him to G-Unit, to give him some validation. I remember that whole stuff. I remember I was in the W Hotel, that whole stuff. He was telling me, yo, they're about to sign me to G-Unit, you dig? But soon as they sign me and I get platinum and all that, I'm doing whatever 50 did to Ja. I'm like, you sure that you want to do that? He's like, F that blood. I'm like, this dude is crazy. This is crazy. Now I'm looking back like this is a part of history. I heard him say it before he even initiated the wild stuff. 
Something to pull from this quote was that Interscope was unsure what to do with the game because they were trying different things with him and it just wasn't working. People forgot that the game was in the freshman class of 2003 with people like Joel Santana, Young Buck, Lloyd Banks, Chingy, and Joe Budden. With G-Unit, 50 Cent blew and then came out with the G-Unit album and then the members of G-Unit were going to drop albums one by one and it started with Lloyd Banks who would release The Hunger For More in June of 2004. The game would appear on the song When The Chips Are Down on that project. The next month in July, the mixtape G-Unit Radio Part 8, The Fifth Element was released. The next month in August, the game would feature on the song Stomp which appeared on Young Buck's album Straight Outta Cashville. At the beginning of September is when the first single for the documentary was released and it was West Side Story featuring 50 Cent. The song would actually start out at number 99 on the Billboard Hot 100 and it remained there the following week but then the song would ultimately fall off the charts completely. A week later it would peak at number 93 but it would fall off again. In the same month of September, the mixtape West Side Story The Compton Chronicles was released and one track that caught my interest was the song Where You At The Whole City Behind Us, which was used in a Boost Mobile ad and like that I heard that that was like really really big back in the day and I really liked the commercial and the song as a whole like everybody killed it Ludacris, Kanye, everybody. Literally the next month JT the bigger figure presents untold story was released. This was a collection of records that the game made up in the Bay Area. The game said that this wasn't his album and that he didn't even have to say it. He considered blocking the release with legal action but opted instead to be given 75% of the record. In November was when Dr. Dre was set to receive a lifetime achievement award at the vibe awards that year and he was attacked the game was there when that happened but he said that he thought that whoever attacked dre waited until the game and 50 cent got out of their seats shortly after this incident is when the mixtape charted to the game was released and this mixtape has certified gangsters on it with jim jones which is a fire song by the way november would be the month that the second single for the documentary was released and it was how we do featuring 50 cent this was a single that really set it off for the game and it ended up peaking at number four on the billboard hot 100. in december we would see the release of you know what it is volume two throwing rocks at the throne which would be the last release before the game's debut album and the hype was at an all-time high for what the west had in store for the rap game in january of 2005 the documentary was released and peaked at number one on the billboard 200 for two weeks selling 586,000 units in its very first week by this time there were starting to be cracks in the relationship between 50 cent and the game but their beef and the beef that the game had with g unit is something that i'm not going to cover in this video the beef really happened after like the documentary was officially released so you know i'm not really going to talk about it in this video some additional stuff about this album is that originally it was supposed to be called nwa volume one so y'all know that I don't really be cursing like that. So that's my way around it. And yeah, it, it was supposed to be called NWA Volume 1. As to the reason why this was changed was due to Easy es widow, Tamika Wright, intervening. The game thought that it was very selfish at the time and that in his words, he said that nobody was talking about NWA until he brought it back and that she might need him one day for something. He also mentions the NWA Volume 1 title in the song Dreams, which appears on the documentary. I actually think that the change from the NWA Volume 1 title to the documentary was relatively late because the game did an interview with MTV in October of 2004 and he was referring to the album as NWA Volume 1. He was even referring to the song that we know today as How We Do as Fresh 83 which we'll get into why it was initially called Fresh 83 at first. In another MTV interview the game referred to West Side Story as his street single and said that Hire was supposed to be his real lead single for his album. The game also contemplated adding the mixtape cut Still Cruising which like featured I guess like I never heard before like verse like or like lyrics from Easy e at the time and you can easily find this song on YouTube now. The documentary was also supposed to release towards the end of 2004 but it was moved to the very beginning of 2005. All right, that's it for this section where I broke down the main events that happened the year before the documentary came out. Now in the second section, I will break down the album track by track while giving you the history behind the making of each song. 
The first track on the album is the intro and the documentary was actually done and sequenced but Dr. Dre said that there needed to be an intro but the game said that he was wrapped out. Dre wanted something that fit perfectly before West Side Story which is the next track. The game thought that it wasn't really going to take long but it took over a month. Dre went through like 30 different samples before he found the one that he was comfortable with. The next track on the album is West Side Story which features 50 Cent and it was the lead single for the album and West Side Story the game raps about how people were saying that the West Coast fell off, but that wasn't the case because there were still people on the West doing their thing while he was asleep in Compton. The game vowed to bring the West Coast back. West Side Story was actually supposed to go on the All About the Benjamin soundtrack, but Dr. Dre thought that the song was just too hard for it and he wanted it to be the first song on the album. The song was actually written in 2002, but the game never went back and edited the lyrics. 50 also wrote the hook for that song, and something that the game says in an interview was that 50 Cent came in after all of the records were already near being done, and he put his quote unquote 50 Cent on them. The game says that he wasn't a part of G-Unit at this time. The game would further say, I hadn't wrote a hook because I figured it was going on the soundtrack, so I figured that Dre was going to figure out the hook. Once he thought the verses were dope, I guess Yes, he put 50 on it then he played it for me the way 50 used to write hooks he's so melodically driven all he would do is listen to the beat and whatever the beat told him to say he would say most rappers they listen to the stuff and they write the lyrics based on how they feel 50 writes it off whatever the beat makes him say it doesn't matter if it's effing i'm cleaning up with tide in the effing kitchen at that time that's how he was rocking and everything he would spit was golden Mike Lynn, who was an A&R at Aftermath, said that this was the first record that Dr. Dre and the game did and that 50 wasn't involved yet. Dreams would be the next track on the album and it was produced by Kanye West as many of us probably already know. But before we get into the song Dreams, something interesting that I found out that aside from producing, Kanye was supposed to feature on the album. The game said that he had Kanye sample a part that he really liked from the movie Jason's Lyric and he wrote a hook for Kanye to rap. Imagine college dropout Kanye rapping about gangbanging and stuff like that because that's like what the game had him doing on the hook, but unfortunately it was one of the songs that was cut from the album. The game originally met Kanye at a party Nelly had and they would have a rap battle with each other that Kanye would ultimately win. This was before the game was with Aftermath and Kanye was at Rockefeller at the time. But them meeting and becoming cool with each other would lead them to working. Kanye told the game that he had a crazy sample called Dreams and Kanye started talking about all the dreams that he had in his life. Kanye sent the track to the game and the game wrote one verse and everybody thought that it was so crazy that they pressured him to finish it. For some reason the game couldn't finish it because there was things that he wanted to say that just wasn't coming out to him at this point. He had writer's block for about two months but then one day something sparked him to go sit on his couch and put the tape in an old CD player. He played the song for about four hours and words just started coming to him and Dreams was one of the first songs that he ever recorded for after. Mike Lynn said that before Dreams, they had recorded about 30 songs, but it wasn't until he played Dreams for Dr. Dre that he finally realized that they could get an album out of the game. Before Dreams, all of the songs that the game presented to them were mixtape songs in their eyes, but Dreams inspired Dr. Dre to get into the studio with him and work with him. Now something that I completely didn't know before I did research was that the game made a completely different version of Dreams compared to the one that we have today. I'll put a link in the description, but both versions of the song are good in my opinion. In this alternate version or original version, the lyrics are completely different. Some of the differences are that the three people that the game mentions in the hook in the original version are Rosa Parks, Richard Pryor, and Luther Vandross. Instead of saying Stevie Wonder with the glasses off, he says Ray Charles. He also says that he had dreams of making an R&B hit instead of hitting an R&B chick as well. Like I said, I'll put a link in the description for you guys to listen to it and let me know what you guys think. The next track on the album is Hate It or Love It featuring 50 Cent. Hit or I Love It came at the midway point of the recording of the album, so this occurred around the beginning of 2004. This song came about right when the game joined G-Unit. The game has said that he writes songs backwards, starting with the third verse, and the reason behind this is because, you know, like the third verse tends to be the weakest in his opinion because you're tired. This is why he starts with the third verse to prevent this. 50 suggested that they should call the song Hit or I Love It, and they came up with the hook for it. Originally, Hit or I Love It was 50 
cents, but it ended up going to the game. Here's what 50 Cent had to say about Hate It or Love It, and mind you, he's referring to the massacre in these quotes. When I wrote for Hate It or Love It, I wasn't sure I wanted to put it on my album, because I was talking about when I was growing up that my mom was kissing a woman. So I put it on games record because I wasn't sure the public was ready to hear that from me, cause we only offered a certain style of content to them. So that was me putting my toes into the tub to comfortably make that transition to make more personal content. Shaw Money XL, who was the president of Gina Records at the time, also said that the song nearly ended up on the massacre and that 50 Cent wrote almost all of the hooks on the documentary. Also, like I said, this is according to Shaw Money XL, not me. This is according to him. Cool and Dre have production credits on the song and they were passing out CDs back in the day and one of the CDs that they passed out landed in the hands of Shaw Money XL. As far as Dr. Dre's production on the track, according to Dre of Cool and Dre, he brought life into the track from the original version of the beat. He added an amazing mix to it and added strings along with other things. Mike Lynn would say, Dr. Dre completely reproduced that track. He had it replayed, he never took credit for it. He still let them get production credit it, that's how he is. It's funny to me when people say Dre took my beat and this and that. It's like, come on, man. All that stuff is BS. I've seen so many producers eating out there because their material sounded professional, but in the beginning of their career, their music wasn't nowhere near professional. Dre made it sound professional. Every record on that album, Dr. Dre touched. Everything. Hater 11 sounded like a sample. Dre made it sound like a record. Dre cleaned it up on the musical side. He had the bass line played, so it actually sounded professional. He made those records. If they played their original version and his version, they're like night and day. He had to get co-production credit, he did all the work. Hater or Love It would peak at number 2 on the Billboard Hot 100, along with being the third single off of the album. The next song is Higher, and the game has said that the beat was originally 50s, but Dre gave it to the game because he didn't like it. The game wrote his three verses for the song in less than half an hour. After Higher, we have the track How We Do, which features 50 Cent. The game was going through Dr. Dre beats when he was not supposed to, while Dr. Dre was out at a meeting. While this happened, the game came across the beat for How We Do, and the beat was named Fresh 83 in the folder. When Dre heard the first verse that the game did, he wanted to finish the song, and the game finished the song, but didn't have a hook. Dr. Dre really wanted a hook, so the game called up 50 Cent, and 50 Cent went and he did the hook. 50 Cent, according to the game, then wanted the song. Angelo Sanders has said something hilarious about the video for the song. He said that they paid about $750,000 on the video that we have today and they just kind of had to shut up and twirl their thumbs and support whatever Hype Williams wanted to do at the time. Angelo hated the video because he thought that it was like a regular rap music video and that they didn't even get like no like new like video vixen girls or like even explosions which is which is kind of funny but the next track would be don't need your love featuring faith evans and the game said that i don't need your love was recorded his first day on interscope he wrote the song in a rental car heading to get a mattress for his new apartment in beverly hills he had gotten a lot of beats from the legendary producer havoc the game had got shot on october 1st 2001, and he recorded I Don't Need Your Love around January 15th of 2002. The game was still in pain, it was still bleeding in his gauzes. His voice is messed up in the song from getting shot in the chest and they never changed it. The game would go back and try to relay his vocals when he got his voice back, but Dr. Dre said no because he liked the rawness. I Don't Need Your Love is one of the game's favorite tracks that he's ever done. Now Havoc did production on the song and has admitted himself that he's not the most organized producer. With the transition of him putting a studio in his house, a lot of beats got lost and misplaced. Havoc did not have the files for I Don't Need Your Love and didn't know what the original sample was, leading to Dr. Dre having to remake everything. According to the game, Dr. Dre remade it almost 100% that the way that it sounded before, you know, Havoc, you know, lost the files, but, you know, with the additional Dr. Dre flavor. The next song would be Church for Thugs, which was produced by Just Blaze. Shawmoney XL said that 50 Cent recorded the hook in Jimmy Iovine's basement because the game couldn't come up with the hook. They were at Jimmy Iovine's house having a meeting, and Jimmy said that they needed a hook for Church of Thugs because it was a big record. According to Shawmoney XL, 50 wrote that hook right there in the basement and did rough vocals for the game to hear it and do it over. Now, Angelo Sanders said that Church for Thugs made 50 Cent, Jimmy Iovine, and everybody take notice 
notice of the game. Angelo Sanders had worked with Just Blaze in the past, so he reached out and Just Blaze gave them like six records that Angelo said were incredible. The game had just laid the verses on the Church for Thugs beat and played it for Dr. Dre, and he went crazy. He immediately had a meeting with Jimmy Iovine and they played the record at Jimmy Iovine's house and Angelo refers to this being the beginning of the G-Unit relationship. Angelo says that Church for Thugs was their record and that it wasn't like 50 Cent brought him that record, especially since Angelo said that it was him that got it from Just Blaze. Another thing that I've seen online is that Just Blaze has said that he'll never release the sample that he used for the song. The next track is Put You On The Game, which was the last single for the album. The beat to this song is just so sick. It was produced by Timberland, and Angelo said that Timberland was very, very high at the time, so they knew that they had to get him for something. The problem was that they needed a single, but they already had one, but there was some doubt, so they wanted one more home run. This is why they went and got Timberland. Angelo Sanders said that the game's manager at the time, Jimmy Hinchman, was really integral in making this happen. Timberland would show up at like 2 or 3 in the morning, fresh from hanging out in the club, and at first they didn't like get it because like it was like their first time working with Timberland. They recognized that it wasn't like he was out partying, not caring about like not doing his job, but instead it was more like he's seeing what's happening right now and that's how he came back and the song Put You In The Game was made. Later on, they will be sued for that song, but I'm not covering that in this video. The game has said that he gets drunk in the studio pretty much every night, but he doesn't necessarily do a song like Start From Scratch every night. It was just one of those nights where he felt like his back was against the wall and he couldn't figure out what was next for him in life, so he just put on the beat. His best friend Billboard had just got murdered, and you'll see a tribute to Billboard in the music video for Hate It or Love It, and you will also see him make appearances on the documentary DVD. Mike Lynn said that Start From Scratch was a turning point for the game because this was when he became a performer and that it was Dr. Dre's idea to get him very drunk. The game was drinking Henny and Coke and it was for him to speak from the heart and not worry about anything. Mike says that there is no way that this song would have came about if the game was sober. The next record is a self-titled song in the documentary and here's what the game had to say about the song. I remember speaking to certain situations with Ed Lover so I got the interviews and you know we went in. I just had to ask asked Ed Lover, can I use that? And he sent it to me. I explained that the Maybach line wasn't about Jay-Z before, but I like it when stuff is set in stone. So people will be like, oh, that's what it was about. If I'm talking about somebody, I don't really gotta do it subliminally. I like it to be known. I'll just say your name, I don't give a F. But in that instance, I meant no harm to Jay-Z in the early stages of my career. In the early stages of my career, I was talking about Ja Rule, everybody knew that we had beef. In the song West Side Story, people thought that the game was taking shots at Jay-Z when the game said, and I don't do button up shirts or drive my box. The game says that this was directed at Ja Rule and in the documentary song is where the clips of the interview where the game is explaining this. Besides this though, the game has actually taken several shots at Jay-Z throughout his whole career and as to why the game has done this is because in 2011, the game explained that he met Jay-Z a long time before that in the 4040 club and he seemed like a cool dude and then asked him a question like how do you stay relevant and the game didn't really like Jay-Z's answer. What Jay said was that most of the new rappers like the game won't last long anyway and that maybe he should think of another lane. The next song is Running, which features Tony Yayo. The game knocked out his verse for Running, but he had one verse that was empty and Tony Yayo had just got out of jail. Tony Yayo ended up getting on the song, but Angelo Sanders says that getting Tony Yayo was his idea because they were going to originally put Lloyd Banks on that song. There's actually an original version of the track with no Tony Yayo and Dion Jenkins had a longer part. The game in this version also starts off with the second verse from the official version and ends off with his first. It's on YouTube and I'll put a link in the description for you guys to hear it for yourself. The next track is No More Fun and Games and this track was also produced by Just Blaze. This was done the same night as Church for Thugs. What followed was the track We Ain't which features Eminem. The game flew to Detroit to work with Eminem for about 5 days and Eminem had 5 beats that he made for him. The game rapped on all of them but the song that appears on the album was the best one according to the game. The game would also say M comes into the studio and he looks like a guy that can't rap at all. He just chills with some sweats on, Jordans, a 
hat and a jacket or a hoodie or something. Then he comes in with more Taco Bell than the law allows, man. Effing Taco Supremes and Mountain Dew. And he listens. How you feeling? You like this joint? Aight, do your thing. Then he goes off in the corner and starts spitting like he's in a cypher. If you look at him, you think there's five other people spitting with him like he's in a real cypher, but it's just him. He writes in circles on the paper. He literally turns the paper, man, and writes from the inside out some weird stuff. M added the samples in the hook. Every voice on there is him. He's like Eddie Murphy and stuff. M can do anything. Dude is a genius. Angelo Sanders actually got a shout out on this track and actually said that they had been waiting on the Eminem feature for a minute and by this time 50 Cent had been involved and everybody had gotten the records in but Eminem. Where I'm From would be the next track and Dr. Dre is the one who got Nate Dogg for the song. The song was originally supposed to be Dr. Dre, The Game, and Nate Dogg. The Dr. Dre version is also on the internet as well, and once again, it's something I will put in the description. I really prefer this original version over the official version because Dr. Dre had a phenomenal verse, and in the comments of this version I listened to, people were saying that it's one of the best verses Dr. Dre has ever spit. Angelo Sanders said that this record almost didn't make the album, but he felt like they needed it because it was one of those LA records that you just can't neglect. The next track is special and it features Nate Dogg again, but originally 50 Cent was on the hook, but the game ended up having Nate Dogg on it. Needles, who is the producer of the track, said that he doesn't really like the beat to that song because the original version of the beat sounded way better. To him, the original version sounds more better and fuller. After hearing the album, Needles wished that he would have like picked like another beat that kind of showcased what he could do. He says, there was some amazing beats on that album. That was probably one of the most well put together albums production wise in a long time. I don't remember hearing anything since then that had back to back to back to back joints. Everyone sees my plaques and they're like, so which one did you do on the game's album? And no one ever knows my joint. Angelo Sanders is also someone who hates special. And personally, I don't really like that song at all. I feel like the album can kind of do like without it, but that's just my opinion. He said that 50 Cent and G-Unit had been coming with these like levy dubby records and special was supposed to be that. Angelo Sanders didn't really want to use it along with the game. It was the label that said that the game needed something for like the ladies. And in retrospect, like I said, I personally don't think that this should have made the album. The next track is Don't Worry, which features Mary J. Blige. And originally Brandy was supposed to be on that track. It was Jimmy Iovine who said that he didn't want his gangster rapper on a song with Moesha. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. J Jimmy, you wrong for that. You wrong for that, Jimmy. <laughs> Ah oh, man, this leads us to the last track on the album, which is Like Father Like Son, which features Buster Rhymes. Here's what the game had to say about that song. It only made sense to end the album with that song. I don't know where else could I put talking about my kid. I don't think it fit in the middle of the album with all the gangster stuff. I did that in the same session I did the Just Blaze joint. I ran through the Just Blaze joint so fast that I just did that one while I was there. I didn't have no hook on it. I came back to LA and Buster was in the studio and I was like, Bust, I need a hook for this. I played the beat and you know Bust is a father too, so it's like I got that stuff all day. I heard the beat and thought of my son. I just thought about my kid being born because that was big for me. Recording that stuff was like I took myself back to the day he was born. I had all the experiences because I just lived them 8 months ago. I was just sharing it with the world. I don't be making up stuff man, that's the stuff that I did, that I went through. These are real life situations, they made me who I am. So they're all my experiences, I wasn't emotional at all, nothing to make you cry. It's just like my experiences. This will conclude me breaking down the stories behind each track on the album and this was definitely one of my most like fun videos that I've ever done as far as like making the video and doing research. I really like learned a lot while making this video and I really wanted people to remember that the game at one point in the game was one of the hottest rappers out and he had classics for sure. I don't really have much more to say since like this is video is already kind of long but all in all let me know what you guys thought of the video in the comment section below. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.